afternoon, Doctor. This is Janet. I'm Susan's twin sister. I know about patient doctor confidentiality, but I really need to know how she's doing. Because of my work and my children, and quite frankly, we've had financial difficulties lately, so I can't get over there easily. Bottom line, I don't think Susan is telling me everything. I just want to know if she's going to be well soon, or if she needs me there. I know she has a lot of friends around her, but I'm her sister. Forty years ago, nobody talked about cancer. I remember the first day I started working in the hospital in Glasgow, and the, the surgical ward in Glasgow was, you come up and there was, to the left was the woman, to the right were the men, and they were completely separated, and there was about 60 beds, 30 on each side, and halfway down the ward was a curtain. So I was walking around and asked the sister, what's the curtain for? She said, it's the cancer patients behind the curtain. So people didn't talk about cancer. Now people talk about cancer. Is cancer still considered a death sentence no, by the people not. in Peru? Uh, well, the people in Peru, we have to, you know, educate them. Uh, but cancer definitely is not a death, death sentence. You know uh, that, but do the people of Peru know that yet? We are working on that. That is why we have instituted the Peru uh, Against Cancer Week. And we do a lot of education. We have radio programs. We go out on, on newspapers. So we're, we're trying very hard to, to tell our people that cancer can be cured and can be prevented, of course. A few years ago, uh, women were paralyzed by the concept of, of, of having breast cancer. And that led to, to situations in which uh, women would not seek attention just because they were scared. They were scared of the whole concept. Uh, we detect now a much more proactive role. Um, the message is out that you can cure breast cancer, that you can cure it if you take a proactive role, if you diagnose early. When the National Cancer Center first opened, the taxis wouldn't come up and wait in our taxi queue because it was a cancer center. Um, th that's, um, that soon stopped. I mean, we, we now have plenty of taxis, but uh, I, it, it surprised me. Um, and it's something that we also have to um, address. So if you look around the cancer center, we have a pink building. And red is a color which is happy, which is auspicious. And that sort of uh, cancels out the inauspicious, um, unlucky um, thing about cancer. So you see our nurses' uniforms are pink or peach color. Uh, the furniture is pink. Um, and so we have a lot of these sort of colors to neutralize, I think, what you would um, say the stigma of cancer. I believe that you have to educate individuals about what cancer is and that doesn't happen the day they, uh, they're given the diagnosis. I think it has to happen before. We have had uh, research in the, among the people uh, uh, and we observe this uh, strong uh, perception of population uh, between cancer and, uh, and uh, death or other uh, suffering situations. The people don't have a perception of cancer is curable. It's not a death sentence for, for most people now, unlike in the past. But still, a lot of people are terribly devastated when they are told that they have a cancer. Or as I just saw half an hour ago, when the cancer comes back in my patient, they are devastated. You know, this particular patient just burst into tears. You see, uh, but having said that, there's a more enlightened approach to um, handling cancer now amongst the lay community. They realise that there's good help on hand. There is a huge fear. It's a, a, people are very afraid of dying with cancer. They're not afraid so much of dying with a heart attack. And that's because, you know, it's sudden. But cancer is a long, drawn-out process. And the end stages are not very pleasant. And so there is a great fear about it. Well, I want things to happen faster. I, I do believe that if we've learned something from the AIDS advocates uh, and to apply to the cancer uh, uh, situation, it is, come on, let's get a move on.
you know, there are a lot of people dying of cancer, and what are we doing sitting in endless meetings and uh, endless uh, uh, planning groups uh, and, and, and appointing ever more administrators to hold charts to find out how well we're doing? Uh, you know, let's uh, roll up our sleeves and, and, and adapt some of the urgency of the challenge. This is a global challenge, cancer. I mean, the WHO have now come out with a statement which has shocked even them, I think. They're saying that the more people die in the world from cancer than from malaria, from AIDS, and tuberculosis put together. So this is a global issue, and there is an urgency about it, particularly in the emerging countries of the, of, of the world where the tobacco companies have, have moved as they've been frustrated in America and in Western Europe, and their profits are beginning to get uh, down a bit, and their shareholders are a little bit agitated. Um, people, you know, the tobacco companies have had less uh, attention lately because the banks have been uh, the source of concern. But you know, the tobacco companies are still out there, and they're still making profit, and they're moving into uh, emerging countries, and they're flogging their wares, and they are creating uh, more and more people with cancer to fill the, uh, the gaps which uh, in, in, in the Western uh, area have, uh, have now been sealed off. While I've told you that we could dream of a day without cervical cancer, I am personally not optimistic that that day is going to come in our lifetimes. Uh, unfortunately, the politicians uh, and governments are just not going to allow that to happen, which is oh so unfortunate. Well, I just say, uh, let us let me operate, please, and quietly. That's uh, uh, an answer for the politician on, and the administration. Uh, I just want to do my job uh, and to cure cancer if it's possible. Uh, I don't care with the uh, administrative paper or that's not my job. There, there's a, inevitably a, a, a roadblock called bureaucracy. No question about that. And whether it's a, 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 a local ethical committee or a, a religious group uh, complaining about uh, a stem cell approach or whether it's a, a government trying to save money uh, using spurious science uh, to uh, bolster their cost of efficacy arguments. Yes, those things are bureaucratic uh, frustrations. Cancer is our leading cause of uh, death in Thailand, so we must use a lot of resource to fight against this uh, kind of uh, deadly disease, but we still have the limited resources not only the financial, but the human resource. So our next challenging problem is how to build our capacity building to fight against this cancer. So not only uh, our own resources, we need some cooperation with the uh, international level. So cancer is not our problem anymore. It's the global problem. We went to the women's jail to find out the cervical cancer problem there, and I found out something, something very interesting. The social security, two private groups, the Ministry of Health, were visiting the women in jail and doing pap smears. So they have three, four, or five pap smears in a year, instead of opening the gate and going to more people and widening the coverage. We at Cancer also have an ethical dilemma in the sense that we're spreading awareness. We're trying to get people to go for early detection or to check their bodies, but are we actually raising expectations because how are they going to get the treatment? A few things we've learned. First of all, I think one of the most important things, and it's often forgotten, is to get the physicians to stop smoking themselves. It's a very, very important point, and I think in the United States, it's one of was one of the harbingers of where the U.S. was going when our physicians began stopping in the late 1950s and 1960s. Early 1950s in the U.S., physicians smoked more than the general population. It was an upper class, uh, upper middle class thing to do. When word became began getting out about the fact that hmm, lung cancer uh, is caused by, uh, by tobacco use, so is heart disease, and so on. And the 1964 Surgeon General's report came out, which was the watershed event in this country. Physician rates went from around 50% in the early 50s down to around 2% today. China, nearly 50% 50, 50 of physicians smoke. India, the data are not, are not as clear. 
But that's, that's one area where we can export what we've learned and really work with health healthcare providers. Yes, we're chipping away at uh, some blocks like colorectal cancer, pancreas cancer. What have we done in pancreas cancer over the last uh, 50 or 100 years? Not a great deal. I wouldn't even think there's a single little chip off that block. So I think it depends on which cancer you're talking about. I think that the, the notion of, uh, of early detection of cancer is now moving from just breast and just cervix into lung and into colorectal uh, cancers and prostate cancers. The men are standing up and saying, where's the screening test for men? And you know, they're quite right to ask that question. And I think we in the cancer research community have got to provide some good answers for that. And that's all coming along uh, very well. It's all very exciting at the moment. We cannot be happy with the results of today. Yes, yes, we have done progress, but there are still too many patients who are dying from the disease. What we get more is money that I consider it's wasted. It is technical support. And I can tell you something. They can come here and teach us how things work in Canada or in the United States or in Europe. But uh, when you want to apply that in Peru, the situation is different. So once you are going to come and teach me how when you do the breast diagnosis program, you have to show them breast self-examination, how to look their breast on a mirror every day. And when you go to the highlands here, you will see that it is sinful. Women never look the body naked because it is sinful. So what they can come and teach us is something that may be useful, but most of the time is, for me, wasted money. We need money to bring things to earth. Our problem is with them. so many things diagnosing situations and not using money in acting at the location. Hi, it's me. So how's it going? I missed your call this morning and I want to know how you're feeling. The pain from the surgery is gone, but uh, the chemotherapy is getting me really tired. And I'm just so afraid every time I go into the radiotherapy room. Sis, I'm just so tired. I'm not sure I can go through with this. I wanted to be strong for you, but now I can't hide anymore. I have to come out and tell you how scared I am of the end. They keep telling me I'm doing fine and they're so nice to me, but... I'm exhausted. I want this to end. What can I do? First mum, then dad, now me. Are we just chipping away at the block or are there breakthroughs on the horizon? Well, I think we've already had a few breakthroughs, and I believe that, uh, you know, that, that, that improving uh, mortality for breast cancer patients, a very, very common cancer, by uh, over 10% in, in 15 years, is, uh, is certainly not chipping at a block. Uh, this is a major uh, step forward. I think that the uh, innovation surrounding prevention with tamoxifen is also a, a big step forward. There will be better preventive agents than tamoxifen coming along. I think things like the HPV vaccine have revolutionized uh, our, our whole approach to cancer. Cancer and viruses? God, who ever thought that was possible? Oh, well, Burkitt uh, and Epstein and Barr did uh, 30 years ago, and uh, they showed the link between the virus, Epstein-Barr virus, and, uh, and cancer in uh, lymphoma in children in Africa and in, uh, in the nasopharynx in, in China, and uh, we have a vaccine for that. But the vaccine for uh, the uh, human papilloma viruses, um, that is really dramatic. There is nothing more powerful than a cancer survivor talking to people in position of power or to the media. That has been our probably main uh, way of working here in the United States that we started to use cancer survivors uh, to put the cancer agenda very high up in the priorities of our government. Besides that, remember, one out of two men and one out of three women are going to develop cancer during their lifetime. So in, even in these countries, people in position of power presidents, uh, congressmen, uh, legislators, they have cancer themselves or they have family members with cancer. Use them. 
talk to them about that. Tell them that cancer is preventable. Tell them that cancer is detectable and show them the reality that you just documented. The emphasis on the prevention side of is to uh, refine the tools that we have. For example, we now can determine risk more precisely and we can focus screening in some respects on high-risk individuals so we can use our resources more economically. That's one, one uh, area that could be refined so that we don't necessarily have to screen everybody with certain uh, predispositions. We can uh, screen high-risk individuals. We're learning more about genetic predisposition for the same kind of purpose. We can focus resources on people who are particularly susceptible to certain types of diseases. The less invasive, the less traumatic, the more people will be persuaded to come for treatment. Also, the more comprehensive we can make cancer treatment. I still don't understand why we don't have breast cancer centers where people can come in, be diagnosed, treated that day, or given a treatment plan that, that is decisive, that, um, that is doable, that takes a lot of the fear out of it, and I think that's coming. That's coming as we develop more technologies and abilities to really diagnose something correctly. From the treatment point of view, the, the very uh, substantial hope for targeted therapy has turned out to be more complicated. If we find a molecular target for a particular compound, yes, it, it may work for a while, but then there is escape that is often incurred, and we have to learn more about how and, and, and why that occurs and, and how to overcome it. That's an important area for, for research, for, for treatment. What's hot? What's... Well, I think what's hot are, are, frankly, the kinds of ideas and projects that were generated maybe 10 or 15 years ago that are now showing promise, anti-angiogenesis sorts of drugs, targeted therapies, uh, RNA interference, uh, technology with the potential to turn off genes that make cancer grow. Um, the, emergen the emergence of better and finer detection techniques. Nanotechnology is, is very big. Uh, immunotherapies. Immunotherapies, the development of strategic and uh, refined um, uh, substances that extend, uh, that, that draw on the body's power to fight off the disease. Um, I think that we are very excited about creating stronger cells that are resistant, resistant to the intrusion of metastatic cancer cells. Those kinds of projects are very exciting to us. From a um, worldwide impact perspective, I believe that continued pressure on tobacco is absolutely a prerequisite. We cannot be satisfied until uh, tobacco usage and the starting of tobacco usage is much reduced. That's a critical target. I have great hope that uh, WHO and the international community and the international donors community will uh, understand and recognize the magnitude of the cancer problem worldwide and will cooperate much more than they have done in the past in trying to tackle that. And I think that this, in my opinion, will happen during the next five years. Uh, and that will be a very important step forward. And I think there will be a role to look at how the stem cell or the cancer stem cell is uh, targeted um, in the future. I, I see there may be a potential to look at these cancer stem cells and how you target them because these are the ultimate terrorists, biological terrorists, in a sense that if you know how to target the cancer stem cell, you might really be killing the, the terrorist cell. So for me over the next 24 months we've got a fantastic project working with some of the best geneticists in the world in that we think we've identified some genes that will allow us to characterize a group of normal people but who are higher risk at developing colorectal cancer than normal. If I can identify these subjects, then we can put them into a screening program because the earlier I catch the cancer, 
the higher the chance I've got of curing it. So we're very excited about that early detection. I'm working with my colleagues developing a new set of anti-cancer drugs around something called a kinase. A kinase is a protein in a cancer cell that causes it to divide and to proliferate and to grow. And we've got high hopes that, that one of our first new inhibitors will be taken into clinical trial in about six months' time. And that's, that's five years' hard work in the laboratory, but terribly exciting for us to take that new molecule into the clinic and see if it's effective. The, the most important question I, I have is how do we utilize our resources to make a difference in low resource countries and, and even medium resource countries? How do we mobilize the political influences adequately? We, we've got striking examples of great individuals who lead wonderful foundations. Gates Foundation comes to mind, the Clinton Foundation, uh, Coleman for the Cure. How do we get these people to be listened to by governments who have the power to make these kinds of changes? I think the probably the most important issue that I see and you have observed is to make sure that the people understand that it's safe. It is there, it's part of the treatment. It's the same way that we are taking our aspirin for our headaches. We have to rely on medicine, and this is a proven medicine. It's a proven treatment. It has saved thousands and thousands of lives and does it as we speak. And that is my aim through the activities I have and the program that I have. I get this message across to say there is a solution there. Let's get together and make sure that there is more access to it for the majority of the world population. How important is high technology to your fight against cancer? For, for us, um, it is important for various reasons. Obviously, we are very interested in uh, passing on the technological advances and the research advances in cancer to our patients. See? The, the second important reason is, interestingly, when we have technology which is of great interest to the doctors, it helps to keep our doctors in public institutions. You see. Um, a lot of doctors are drawn by the allure of money in the private sector, but if you have interesting things to keep them intellectually challenged, then they will stay in the public system. You see. So that is another very important consideration for us. Once you're suited up to go in, um, you have to observe the uh, strictest level of uh, production. So can I step here? Or yes. Not? Yes. You can, you can sit down here. This is interesting. So this yes. is sticky. Yeah. yeah, it is sticky. Um, it's meant to clean your shoe before you put your shoe yeah, power. Trap any yeah. dust particles onto the sticky bits. Wow, that is great. Okay. okay. So these are disposable. You never wear them again. So we're going in to see an exceptional facility that is used for vaccine production, which you will explain to me. What is your name, please? Gaina. Gaina? Yeah. Gaina. Gaina. Gainer. Oh. Gloria oh, Gaina. Gloria Gaina. Oh. Gloria Gaina. A little chilly. So this is where I produce my vaccines. I use this facility to prepare the vaccines. Okay, this is the sterilization room, meaning whatever we need to autoclaw to sterilize, this is where we put Perform this in the room. So these are all the rooms where we produce our vaccines. So different kind of vaccines will be produced in their own uh, facility. We try not to mix them up. So this is actually a biosafety cabinet. So all the uh, preparation of vaccines and cell culture work, we do it under this hood. Uh, this is the fridge where we store all the reagents that we need to prepare the vaccines. Um, and other basic equipment like microscopes and all. And as you can see, it's fairly a new environment. We haven't actually stored anything yet. Do you find it rewarding to do this kind of work? Uh, definitely because you meet the patients and you're treating them with these vaccines. So it is quite um, satisfying to see um, you helping the patients and all. In 10 to 15 years from now, we're going to have a complete new way of looking at the cancer uh, uh, problem we are not going to be any longer talking about breast cancer, lung cancer, or colon cancer. That's going to be of very limited use. 
we're going to be talking about the molecular features of each specific tumor. We're going to truly try to understand what drives that specific tumor. And you are not going to have two breast cancers alike. We're going to be having genomic signatures. We're going to have protein signatures and other markers that will tell us not only how that specific cancer is going to behave, but also it will tell us how to treat it appropriately. The colleague of mine who is at the Cancer Research Center who is looking to find out uh, what genes are deregulated in the progression from HPV infection through the various stages to invasive cancer. And one of the reasons for doing that is that if you can identify genes that predict progression, then this is a really important thing you might be able to put in your screening program. So instead of, at the moment, pap screening, you look down a microscope and you look at changes in the morphology of the cells. In other words, you eyeball it. And the, this, if you could start to identify genes that are deregulated and their proteins, then you would be able to put in a much more objective molecular mechanism. We are over-treating and under-treating patients because of our lack of knowledge on how that specific cancer will behave on how, or how that specific cancer will respond to therapy. We'll also have much better ways to monitor success. We're going to know from day five whether specific therapy is working or not. And therefore, we're going to be able to change therapies in the middle before giving eight or nine cycles of chemotherapy that might not be the best therapy for that specific woman. How's the, the field going to change? I think there's a, couple of, there's a couple of exciting, really exciting areas. I think tumor initiating cells, cancer stem cells, so not the same as embryonic stem cells, but the same basic concept that we used to think that cancer was sort of a homogeneous disease where all the cells were the same and if one of them broke off and went someplace else, it would initiate a cancer. Well, we don't think that anymore. We, the, the new evidence just over the last few years of the, that cancers are a mix of stem cells and differentiated cells, and you, what you need to kill are the cancer stem cells. And in the past, all the chemotherapy trials have been used as, a, as uh, you know, is, if, to know if the therapy is effective, you ask, does it shrink measurable disease? And if you can shrink 90, if you can kill 99% of the cancer cells, that was thought to be a good thing. But it turns out that maybe you don't need to kill 99%, you need to kill the 0.1% that are the stem cells. And, you can't, and, we, and we have not been good at measuring that until recently. And now, just over the last two to three years, this area has really exploded. And the recent AACR meeting, the cancer stem cell sessions were always standing room only because this is where the, the buzz and the excitement is, is that maybe we've been measuring the wrong thing all along. And a drug that makes you throw up, makes your hair fall out, and shrinks your cancer, may not be hitting the right cells. And, they'll, they, and the stem cells are still there, and they're going to grow back. And this, that's the experience, right? You get sick, you get better for a while, and then you get sick again. And so if you hit the cancer stem cells, then maybe the tumor won't shrink quickly. So you would have scored the drug negatively in the past. But a year from now, there won't be any more stem cells, and the tumor will go away. Is there consensus on that track? No. No, because no, it's too early. You know, the three phases of science is nobody believes you, uh, everybody completely dismisses you with you, then, you the, then they tell you you're completely wrong, and then it's common knowledge. So we're sort of at the, I think we're crossing the threshold into the, the right experiments have been done by the leaders in the field, and, and it looks like it's really true, and over the next two or three years, I think you'll even start to see some therapies that target it. The genetic experiments that say if you knock out the, the cancer stem cell, you prevent the, the cancer from coming back are starting to come in and it, it looks very convincing. We're going to also going to have vital gene chips in our pocket. It's going to be like a CD-ROM, like a pen drive with our information and we'll be able to predict our personal risk of cancer. You've got to have hope but you've got to also have the three elements are faith, hope, charity. You've got to have hope or else it's pointless doing what we're doing, it's pointless proceeding, it's pointless doing anything if we don't have the inner belief and the hope that things are going to get better. You've got to have faith that the research that you're doing, that the treatment you're going to give, that the way you're treating a patient, you've got to have faith that that's the best thing you can do for the patient, that's the best thing you can do for society, and you're going to make progress. 
And at the same time, you've got to have a very charitable approach. Charity comes in the individual donations, the individual setting up of organisations and helping people who are worse off than you are. But it also comes from the, the, the huge, mega-level charity of creating this fund that we spoke about, because that would be an enormous contribution. So we've got to have the three elements. You've got to hope that things are going to get better. You've got to believe that you can make it better. But at the same time, you've got to be working to get the resources in place to make sure that you can accomplish what you can accomplish. So often over the last 35, 40 years, especially after Richard Nixon declared war on cancer, we've talked about the light at the end of the tunnel. We've actually made people think that uh, very soon we're going to have no cancer, no more cancer. Truth be told, uh, we've made tremendous progress. Uh, but progress is slow and progress is incremental. So I'm not as upset about the use of the word breakthrough, but I do understand that we need to give people a realistic view of what's going on and a realistic hope. And that is, I would say that if we're going to have a world without cancer, it's probably going to happen uh, greater than a century from now. But I would anticipate as I've seen over the last 15, 20 years, that there is going to be less cancer. We've had uh, dramatic decreases in our mortality rates. If we just simply did what we've already learned, we could decrease mortality rates by even more. We're going to be able to tell daughters of patients with cancer if they have risk of inheriting the cancer or not in a way that will be precise. And therefore, we'll be able to eliminate the fear in patients, or in, not in patients, in, in, in people that have no risk of developing cancer. And for those that have risk, we'll be able to implement a la carte uh, uh, programs for detection and for therapy. In terms of treatment, the drugs are going to get better, the drugs are going to have less side effects and be more targeted toward the molecular things that are going wrong inside the cell. I would actually anticipate that we're going to find a group of individuals who don't have clinical cancer but are destined to in the next 10 or 15 years to get cancer and we can actually treat them before they actually have an illness and actually prevent them ever getting cancer at a molecular level with things that have very little side effects or no side effects. Let, let's dream a little bit about what the, the, the long-term future is like in cancer. Okay, I like to dream. <laughs> they say that if you don't dream, you don't get anything because first everything occurs in your dreams. Well, dreaming, I would say that at the end of the road, cancer is a m mutation in your genes. When some of your genes get crazy, mutate, then some of your cells are going to divide in a disorderly manner. So if you are able to identify the genes early enough to intervene and change that mutation, then you would avoid cancer. So dreaming out, I would say that someday when new babies are born or maybe before that, maybe, maybe just at the moment of uh, fecundation, you know, when the sperm meets the egg, they are going to analyze the chromosomes and they are going to identify all known mutations for cancer and they may be able to change those and the baby is going to be born without the, uh, the opportunity to develop cancer. Uh, that's the dream. That's the dream that is called genetic medicine, that's called personalized medicine. That's in terms of preventing it. In terms of treating it, the future probably holds that they are going to do the same thing, an analysis of your cells, an analysis of your cancer cells, and they would develop not only the best chemotherapy, but the right doses of chemotherapy that you need or you don't need. Because there are some cancers, like some prostate cancers, that are very um, uh, slow growing and you may die of something else, not from cancer. So. The future probably holds that hope that we will have this personalized medicine and we will be able to tell patients, you need this medication at this dose, or you know what, you have cancer, but you don't need any medication at this time. We're going to require different skills. We're going to require mathematicians. We're going to require a whole new way of thinking. We have been thinking up till now, doctors, in a very linear way. That's gone. 
we have to uh, think m much more like a matrix process. Uh, we'll have to integrate uh, better all our knowledge. So it's going to be Division. fascinating. I think that in the next 15 years, cancer care will change more than all what we have done from the beginning of medicine until now. There's a, certainly a reason for much hope um, across the world and in, and in Europe today, and I think it's extremely important for the public to know that. And that's not just as far as breast cancer is concerned, but all cancer. And I think sometimes that people, because they're so afraid of the word, in some places they call it the big C, in other places there are taboos, but they're so afraid of the word that they don't even know that today, with all of the research that's gone on and all of the diagnostic, cap diagnostic capabilities that exist, that there's so much good reason, if there's any sign of cancer, for a person to go, get, get it detected early, get it taken care of, there are many, many treatments and many good outcomes for people in across all the areas of cancer today. And it's an extremely important thing for people to understand so that they don't avoid it, they don't wait too long, um, and allow themselves to, uh, to die of a disease when it's not necessary because today many people will be cured across many different types of cancer. In the physical aspect of cancer, in the biology aspect of cancer, we are developing new treatments, wonderful treatments, and we, of course, we have wonderful ways to detect and prevent it. So that's in the physical health component. In the mental health component of a person with cancer, we are learning that providing support very early to the patient with cancer and their families is going to really open their eyes and is going to make possible a more a life with much more quality for the future, the mental health component. So support, maybe some psychological support, uh, that's extremely important. And the spiritual side, because remember we human beings are physical, mental and spiritual. In the spiritual side, there is a lot we can do for a cancer patient. If the cancer patient finds that his physical condition is being controlled by doctors, the mental health component is well supported by family members and by themselves, then the spiritual side comes very strong. These people, they write books, they help other people, they help us in advocacy. So that's the spiritual component. So what I want to say is that hope is there for a patient with cancer in many regards both in the physical and mental, also in the spiritual side. I think uh, the really positive side to this is that, as I say, there is early detection. Getting a mammography is not a terrible thing. It's an easy thing for a woman to have. Should a woman be diagnosed early, the treatments themselves are not nearly as difficult as they were before. There's every chance that a woman can avoid a mastectomy and have breast-conserving surgery. Even the treatments themselves are not as damaging to women necessarily as they were in the past. And the recovery can be completely and almost total. It depends on the situation. I think there's no question that in 20 years' time we will have uh, better treatments uh, and better outcomes. I think we will move focus away from perhaps the big uh, cancers with good survival rates to cancers which, like pancreatic cancer and like esophageal cancer, um, where uh, survival rates are terrible. Um, and we'll do some more focus work in improving those survival rates. Paul's will be knowing everybody that cancer is preventable, that everybody in Poland will be knowing that you can, in some localization of cancer, have yearly diagnosis and very successful treatment. Uh, I will be very happy that people understand as well, and this is one of our Eastern European problems, that as quickly I react to something which is wrong in my uh, in my body, then uh, results of treatment is better. This is what I would be happy that uh, to the end of my life happened in Poland. India is changing very rapidly. You, you have huge progress in, in the medical world today. There are lots of new hospitals coming up. The private partnership is, uh, the, in, in the private sector, 
uh, India is business, big business today. So you have hospitals coming up at every level, right from the urban setting to the lower, the second and the third tier hospitals. Do you think that cancers can and will be cured by the end of this century? Or is this a disease that we're just going to have to live with for a little bit longer in our history? I think definitely we're going to cure it by the end of this uh, century. Yes, because it's a genetic problem. And we are so into genetics that we're going to, I'm sure we're going to cure it. We're going to die for some other matters in the 22nd century. The concept of gathering, of community, of celebrating hope, of focusing on a goal, giving each other courage and going forward. There's a lot of knowledge that exists already and if only we can translate that into real and um, practical action, I know that hundreds of thousands of lives could be saved by the application of that which we know already. So perhaps that's what we say. And if we're saying it in Latin, it would be nama tipsa, scientia potesta stes. And Francis Bacon meant knowledge is power by hugging it to oneself and using it as a lever to control. We're saying the opposite. Let's share knowledge at every level of the cancer journey. And perhaps that's the message that we would take to the world. One day, Tanzania will be a country where people don't need to suffer unnecessarily because they have advanced cancer. Yeah. That is doable, even with the resources that we have. I hope we will be able to reach that stage one day. We want everyone talking about it all the time. We're chipping away and chipping away and chipping away. Every advance brings us a better understanding. We start to understand how to shape our therapies. But to be blunt, the best way of dealing with these diseases is to identify the causes and to reduce the causes and exposure to them in the populations. Other than world peace, what could be a more laudatory thing to strive toward? And it's not a pipe dream. It may have been something that we used to dream of and fantasize about and pray for, but we now have the evidence. Not everybody, but most people are genetically predestined to live a healthy lifespan if, if they have access to high quality health care and if, of course, they follow a healthy lifestyle. You and I share a few things. We both wear glasses. We both lost our hair. We're both about the same age and we both got beards double. Uh, but we've also shared something else very, um, very emotional. We both lost our mothers to cancer. I spent the last, my mother had kidney cancer. And my I spent mother had bladder cancer. Bladder cancer. And I spent the last six months, I took time off work, and I spent it with her by her side um, as she went through excruciating pain. And so palliative care is something that is difficult. I, I don't want to open wounds or necessarily talk about something personal, but I'd <clears throat> like to know a little bit about how your mother passed away and what it was like for you personally. Uh, my mother, uh, she got uh, bladder cancer, but my mother she was very fortunate in her journey because she had access and that is the key word here she had access to the best thing that medicine could provide to a person with cancer number one she got access to early detection because bladder cancer when found usually kills the person in one or two years she lived 12 years why is that because the cancer was found very, very early because she had access to a good doctor and a good cystoscopy and the cancer was found early and she got access to the best doctor who came, got out the cancer right on time. The, my mother lived 10 wonderful years. At the 10th year, the cancer came back. And then she had access again to the best kind of treatments that a person with a recurrent cancer could have. She had treatment in surgery, she got treatment in BCGs, all the treatment that she can get. Then, after two years, the cancer came back with force, and it was almost the end of her, the cancer. And my mother, she, I used to speak a lot with her. But during this journey, I used to provide her with pamphlets and information and DVDs or whatever it was, because she was always asking me, so she had access to good information. So she had access to early detection, our access to good treatment, our access to education. My, one day my mother told me, listen, hijo, 
this condition is re really getting, is getting a lot of pain. A lot of pain. I'm going to let you know when the time comes for you not to do anything else. Okay, that's it. That's fine. So I used to travel a lot to Peru from the United States. I remember this one um, morning in February of 19, I mean, 2006. Oh, so it's recent <clears throat> as well. Yes, two years uh, ago. Like mine. So, I remember this morning of February of 2006 and she, I was with her in Lima and she said, Hijo, this is it. You are giving me morphine injections, you are giving me all these pills, I'm all constipated, this is it, this is the end. Uh, she said, this is the, the, do something. So I called my friends at the National Cancer Institute in Peru, the INEM, and we took her to the hospital and we put her a morphine pump. It was a Wednesday afternoon. She slept that night very well. Next morning, Thursday morning, I had to come back to the United States. I went to her room, like five o'clock in the morning, and I found her awake. And I told her mother, how are you doing, are you awake? She said, yeah, I'm awake. Didn't you sleep? And she said, no, on the contrary. I have never slept so well since you were little babies. Oh, really? And what about the pain? And she said, you know what? The pain is there, but who cares about the pain? My mother lived three more months wow. without pain. There were no more screamings at home. So I remember in my way to the airport that morning, and I said, mission accomplished. This is why I get the education I got for my mother. And I promised her something. And I really am honored and grateful to the American Cancer Society that is giving me the opportunity to fulfill the promise I made to my mother. I promised my mother, mother, I'm gonna do everything that's in my power to make possible that every single person has access to the access you have throughout your cancer journey. And that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to give information to people. I'm trying to promote programs in Latin America. I'm trying to work with whoever I can so people have access because that is the golden word. We don't have enough access. Our people, they don't have enough access to cancer education, cancer detection, cancer treatment, all that stuff that my mother had. Un honor conocerte. No. Gracias. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> cancer is? Cancer is? Cancer is? That's a hard question. Cancer is? I think... Um, how many words am I allowed to use to explain it? Cancer is a, a problem for public health. It's a problem for premature death. It's a challenge for scientists. It's a challenge for people with cancer. It's a challenge for the whole global community. And it's a challenge that we've got to rise and meet and do something about to conquer it. Thank you. Here we end our journey into the world of cancer, as seen by 52 experts worldwide. Is there hope? 
Are there solutions? We think so. We also think that the world of cancer is filled with incredibly devoted scientists, doctors, advocates, even volunteers, and we thank them. But more needs to be done, much more. So do it, cause change. Get involved in the fight against cancer. Don't know how? Then find out. Our last thought, cancer's best medicine remains love and friendship. <laughs>